why you know, it took the Canadian government as long as it did to take such a strong position against apartheid. You always had Ethan Baker who came up with a very strong position, but really not until um, Mulroney and, and midway through his first term did he did, uh, did, did sort of kind of return to this activist type of position. I think the question's been answered. Um, Walter said, referring Sorry, to excuse me, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, I wanted to say that I would appreciate it if you could um, move your microphone very close to you okay. because we are recording and if the, if the audio is okay. low, the, the video won't pick it up. And th is that okay? Yeah. I think the question's been answered. I think Walter said it with Namibia. Uh, the birth came, we exited. Okay, that's what we did in Namibia. I think we did the very same thing in South Africa. But the other question that's been answered is by John. I think it was political activism in Canada. I remember the, the noise that was going on all around, the coverage in the national press. Um, I remember CBC documentaries on it. There, there, was, there was an alive sense of real public pressure to do this thing. And I think the politicians of the day felt then enabled to take these risks that have been referred to. So I think the questions have been, have been answered. But what I don't understand is why, and that this is something that somebody may be able to come up in this, this, this conversation over the next day or two, the next day and a half. Why did we not continue to build on all that access, on all that influence, on all the political capital that we, we built up? I don't know, I'm honestly, why we closed the IDRC office. Mm -hmm. It was the largest going concern we had as an organization. And I, I know we were welcomed there by, by the senior people in the then government. I know government changed and things happened then. But why in the world would we move out of all the things we'd invested in and lose that opportunity to remain prima inter pares, if we may say that? So we could I make just one comment about uh, the uh, question of the timing of reaction or the slow build? If you take a look today at the present government and relationships with the United States, across the Canadian government today, almost everything is seen in the, in the prism of the free trade agreement. And if you take a look at the sanctions issue, which started in 85, I didn't get really involved in this until 80, late 86, 87. Mm -hmm. The question of the Canada was a part of the G7. Here you had most of, if not all, of the G7 on the other side of the issue uh, supporting stronger sanctions. So the question of mobilizing, <laughs> and some of this mobilization supported by, as Keith was rightly said in John, the Canadian uh, thing, was also to mobilize support within the Commonwealth, within the United Nations community, and others and, and around that sanctions issue. John, did you want to reflect on that? No, I think that, that that's some bureaucrats who uh, should better leave these things. <laughs> you don't act like a bureaucrat. <laughs> uh, we have uh, some questions here now from the floor, please. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well. Yes, I'm Manfred Bienefeld. I'm an old friend of Linda's. She's partly responsible for my having to come to Carleton. Uh, I was at IBS for, for quite a number of years. And I just wanted to, to uh, introduce some, what I would consider broader contextual factors which might allow the discussion to uh, broaden and, and to deepen uh, in terms of our analysis. We have to remember that the years, particularly the years leading up to the late 80s, the dramatic changes, were years in which there were global developments which set the frame for this. The Berg Report was issued in 18, 1981, mm -hmm. and it was the first, what I think one could describe, full-on neoliberal statement about how to deal with right. development. It, mm -hmm. Its basic message was crass and direct, get the governments out of the economy, and then Africa will thrive. And I remember writing a review of that report while I was at ES, at IBS saying that there was no historical or theoretical foundations for such claims. If Africa in its then situation was suddenly exposed to the full force of global competition, it would very likely suffer grievous losses. And when those realities eventually came to be recognized, came to fruition, nobody would learn any sensible lessons because 
by then the quote political crazies would be out in the streets and people would say, oh, they're the cause, and they would not understand why things haven't changed. So maybe when you go back to the townships in Namibia and you go back down to the townships in South Africa and you discover that not much has changed, maybe that's because this enthusiasm, which latched onto the really radical civil society movements, was actually about bringing South Africa into the fold. Uh, in, 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 into a set of policies which have been, on balance, I would say, deeply problematic, if not disastrous. And we have to remember that they haven't had those negative consequences only in Africa. The political crazies are now in the streets in the United States, <coughs> and uh, income inequalities have exploded around the world, not just in Africa. So that puts a slightly different uh, feel to the things we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. Good. Sule Gariba from Ghana, and uh, I have a long history with Linda Freeman as uh, one of the very first PhD students. I suffered the very 